Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here, or you've been sitting in the shadows, and you enjoy what you are hearing, please make best friends with that subscribe button, and don't forget the other friend, your notification bell. Make sure to have that one set to all, that way you'll know every time I upload, which tends to be daily. If you're curious on how to become a member of Back to Ashes, or you would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Backwoods Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Hello. To start this story, I want to say I had not seen anything like this in my life. At the time, I was 15 years old, pet sitting for a friend of mine's dog. While they were out of town and in Benson, Arizona, is where this took place. This property had a lot of acres and it took about 15 minutes to get to their little house right in the middle of probably 75 acres. At the time, it was about, I want to say maybe 10 p.m. My friend had eight dogs and they usually stayed outside for the most part because they were big watchdogs who seemed to have been able to defend themselves in the past. Before everything happened, I was inside their tiny home making food. And when I heard her biggest dog start squealing kind of quietly, very scared and in pain, but loud enough for me to hear, I knew the sounds were unusual this dog was making. I shot up and ran outside to see what was going on. I thought maybe the dog might have hurt itself or something similar, but this was not the case. And I end up seeing a five foot six, tall, pale, very skinny creature hunched over this dog sucking on his head. I was very stunned, almost too stunned to speak, but I managed to shake the feeling off. I started yelling at this thing because the dog started yelping loudly and I'm telling the creature to get out of here and trying to scare it, and I run over to her dog as fast as I could, because I've heard of these things before, perhaps a chupacabra, and I know they would likely eat the dog if I didn't do something, but I always stop at about 10 feet in front of it to see this creature jump up and run as fast as it can away. I couldn't help but keep looking over my shoulder the rest of the time I was there. I also didn't let those dogs out at night, and I didn't care to go out there either. So when my friends came back, I told everyone what happened and what I saw. It felt like everyone was just as frightened as I was, and made me even more unsettled. I ended up leaving that desert and did not look back still don't know what to make about it to this day, except I know it was something demonic. This happened to me and my friend Sam three winters ago. We liked exploring nature and walking around outside and our friends had recently introduced us to the beautiful place in Wisconsin, Grant Park for anyone familiar with southwestern Wisconsin parks, that we had visited with them three or four times. Every time we had gone with them, it had been a pleasant trip. We walked around, got to see some beautiful views of Lake Michigan, sat in crooks of trees and talked about books and games and other things. We had been starting a new game of Hunter, the Darkness. It's a tabletop RPG game like Dungeons and Dragons. And we were using the park for scenic inspiration. 
It was great. For the purpose of storytelling, she and I are both five foot two, five foot three females. The first time she and I went alone, we went around dusk to take some pictures that we could Photoshop for the game. This park is massive and there are many bridges, footpaths, and winding roads all throughout. We were walking over a bridge that set against one of the roads, with dense woods on either side. As we were crossing, a car drives by and rolls down the window, and some guy leans out and yells, Hey! at us. We were both startled and jumped, but dismissed them and continued walking across the bridge. Less than a minute later, the same car comes back driving the opposite direction, and this time the driver's window rolls down, and the driver, yet another male, calls out, Hey ladies, come here! We pick up our pace, a car drives by, and right and right as we are about to hit the end of the bridge, we see the car coming at us again from the original direction. We then book it up into the trees, up the hill, and we hear the car stop and the two men start yelling for us. We continued running and hid in the dark for 15 or so minutes until they left. And we ran back down to our car and left. You would think we would avoid the park after that. But once we had gotten out of there and properly warmed over a hot chocolate from Perkins, we had a good laugh over having been so scared. We went back to the park with our male friends a few times, and nothing even remotely scary had happened. So she and I decided to go back, just the two of us again. Sam and I often spent our afternoons and early evenings exploring the outside, hiking, geocaching, just sitting outside in parks and talking. So we had just decided to add it to our repertoire. We headed back down at dusk again and with the camera to take more pictures, especially since we hadn't gotten the shot we had wanted the first time. Now, obviously, looking back on this, we both feel incredibly foolish having gone back alone and around the same time and at that same place, but as I had said, we had gone a few more times with our male friends and even when we had just one male with us, nothing had happened, so we thought we were just being skittish. Anyways, we went back and were about to walk over the same bridge when a car rolls by and, as you guessed it, the window rolls down and some guy just yells out some random noise. This time, we don't wait for them to drive around. We duck into the woods and start walking back toward the pier. We figured we'd abandon the other photo spot and just explore the pier and take some lake photos. Not really what we were looking for, but we figured if we made it in time for the sunset, which was almost all the way down now, we could take some nice pictures over the lake just for fun. The way that the pier is set up is that there is a long thin road from the top of a giant grass hill down and around a curb and straight into the parking lot. The pier is at the end of the right side of the parking lot about 200 yards away. If you walked from near the pier down the right side of the parking lot, there was a little bridge that led into a development with a tennis court that sat next to the preserve. So, we began walking down the road to the lake when the same car from before drives around into the parking lot by the pier. They didn't say anything as they drove past, but we still decided to slow down and decide whether or not we wanted to continue down by the pier. The car turned around in the parking lot and came back up to the road. The car reached where we were and stopped, so we immediately turned and started walking down the hill. All the windows rolled down and we saw that there were four guys and one girl in the car. They all yelled, Hello! And Sam and I turned and waved. One of them said, 
Oh, <laughs> how cute. And the others joined in. Hey, yeah, um, wait for us. Now, mind you, we are two small females, but we were also super bundled up in a large winter coats and hats. You could barely see any of our faces or our shapes, so they didn't really have a lot to base it off of. We've been ignoring them, and we hear someone yell, We're coming back for you! as they start driving up the hill. Sam and I decided not to take any chances and start running down the hill. We hear hooting and hollering and see them disappear over the top of the hill. We start running towards the bridge. It was the closest. And once you've gotten over the bridge to the left, there was a concrete deck with a drop off to a ramp about five feet tall so that if you got off the bridge and jumped down right away, you'd be at the bottom of the ramp and couldn't be seen from the other side if you dug down, which is exactly what we did. We hear the car speed back down the hill and four doors open and close as they all start screaming and laughing. Come here, girls. <laughs> we'll be nice. We just want to play. Most of them took off to the pier, but two of them stayed behind, and we could make out bits and pieces of what they were saying. Where do you think they went? Uh, I don't know. We'll find them, though. Etc. Sam and I huddled and freaked out, and once it had been silent near the bridge for a while, we decided to peek out to see if the other two also left so we could sneak back up the hill or make a break for it somewhere else. We peek over, and there's a guy on the other end of the bridge, and he clearly sees us. Over here, he yells to his buddies, and starts running across the bridge to us. We take off toward the development, running around the side of the tennis court, while being chased by three of the guys. Only one of them is very close to us, about 30 feet, but the rest were catching up faster than we would have liked. We took a quick turn between two houses in the subdivision, and we luckily never saw them from that point on. We got back to our car by walking through the forest preserve incredibly slowly, dashing across the roads, terrified out of our minds. We left that night and called our friends we normally went to the preserve with. From then on out, they insisted on accompanying us any time we went there. So, to the creepy people in the cars at the forest preserve, I hope we never run into you again. This story is told as it happened from my perspective. I am from Finland, and that's also where these things I'm about to describe to you happened. This was many, many years ago, pre-smartphone era sometime in the 90s. Yes, I know, I'm old. It was the last of the summer. Myself and two friends were on a camping trip up in the north in Lapland. The mosquito season was over, and the weather was cooling down in anticipation of the coming fall. The three of us had packed food and gear for a 10-day trek. I used to be quite the avid outdoorsman in my youth. The car we arrived in had been left at the parking lot of a visitor center within the premises of the Urho Kokonan National Park, a 985 square mile stretch of wilderness near the Russian border. The terrain there varies greatly from treeless and semi-mountainous. We don't have real mountains in Finland, but we have what we like to call the Tunturi, which is close, to somewhat dense forests of spruce and birch. There are lots of swamps, saying reindeer is not uncommon, and some nights you might hear wolves in the distance. You even theoretically run into a bear in this place. But of course, normally they avoid people. We mostly camped in a tent 
but some nights we used shelters and simple huts provided for travelers free of charge by the forestry service called Aeropat and Finnish. The trip had lasted five days. We were at the furthest of any kind of civilization we were going to be at. On that particular outing, truly in the middle of nowhere, there really is nothing there. There are no villages, towns, or industry. The place is a massive national park after all. Seeing other hikers happen from time to time, You'd see some people in the distance, maybe. Very rarely would you come face to face with anyone. So, in the middle of our camping trip, we had camped in a small clearing, woodland extending around us for a considerable distance in all directions. It was already dark. We had eaten our evening meal, and all three of us were jammed in our only tent. It was a bit cramped, but we fit. It was a large tent. We took turns carrying it during the hikes. We were just exchanging some jokes and crude humor in the dark, like guys in their 20s do, about to go to sleep in our sleeping bags. When we quieted down, we began to hear it. Talking. And the sound of machinery. Given our location, this was profoundly weird. We camped in a tent because there were no huts nearby. Maybe there was another camp somewhere near us? We couldn't quite make out what was being said, but it was a human voice, no doubt about it. Distant droning, but nothing really could explain the sound of heavy machinery. It sounded like an excavator or a tank, something big and powerful and really not too far away. Combined with the sound of talking, we thought, okay, maybe we're in a construction yard. But at that time of night in an unpopulated protected nature reserve, we got out of our tent. It was cold and pitch black. The campfire had some coals still glowing. We took out our flashlights. My two buddies have always been a little braver than me. The sound was clearly coming from the direction of north, maybe half a kilometer away. We thought the construction might be going on behind a small hill some distance away. We could see no lights or anything. We still could not make out what was being said. The speaking like voice was monotonous, and it was impossible even to say what language was being used still sounded a lot like a person speaking though you may be aware of the sort of spooky phenomenon of hearing human voices and static maybe you'd use a blow dryer or been sure someone is talking turn it off and it was just something the brain tried to interpret from the steady hum maybe it was sort of like that it's hard to explain the machinery-like sound continued, not loud, but you could sort of make out the powerful engine. At times, it was accelerating or adding power. At times, at idle. My two friends resolved to go find out what was going on. We put our warm clothes back on, donned our boots, and I sat next to the dying fire, adding some more wood to it. I would stay at camp while my buddies left to go check on this mysterious construction yard in the middle of nowhere in the Lapland woods. So there I sat. The guys took out their maps, took a compass heading, and left, and I could hear them make their way through the forest, see the light from the flashlights and all. Then they were gone. The weird sounds continued unaltered. They were gone. 15 minutes, then maybe 30, then the better part of an hour. It was odd, judging by the volume of the sound. They should have reached it and checked it out and been back already. I added more firewood and tried to make out what the person or persons talking was saying, but it was too tiny and obscure. Soon the guys had been away for more than two hours. I figured they had stayed for coffee with the construction guys or something. 
Then, the sound stopped. Just like that, it just ended. All at the same time. The engine sound and the voice both quit. It was very silent. I waited for another 30 minutes, very worried now that something had happened. That maybe my friends were lost. Should I go and try to find them? I shouted their names several times and built the fire pretty big. I was scared shitless when suddenly I saw the flashlights of my friends approaching. Apparently, they were returning in a hurry. The guys got back to camp out of breath. They told me the following. They had followed the sound beyond the small ridge in the distance. There was nothing there, and it seemed like they were not getting any closer to the source of the sound. They had to stop every now and then, be quiet and listen to whatever it is to be able to walk towards it. They walked and stopped like this for some time, then realized they were not getting any closer. The sounds did not change in volume at all. They decided to go just a bit further, several times, when suddenly the sound was stopped like someone pressed a button on a recording. They realized they had been going on for a long time. They were in the middle of the dark woods alone. They reversed the heading and started back at a brisk pace. Eventually, they saw my big ass fire from the top of the hill and found their way back. The weird thing is, we seemed to think the sound stopped at different times. They had been gone two and a half hours in total. They said the sounds stopped at around an hour and 15 minutes after they left. They then started to head back immediately, return trip taking a bit longer, even though they kept a good pace. They apparently wandered around a bit semi-lost in the dark. For me, the sound stopped at the two hour mark, just 30 minutes before they returned. We did not sleep that night. Nothing more happened on that trip and we found out what the weird construction yard-like sound was about. When we returned to the park's visitor center some five days later, we asked about it, and no one seemed to know of any ongoing construction taking place in the whole national park area. It's been bugging us ever since. So, I live down in Georgia, and I'm deep in the country in Dublin, where the closest store is six miles away, and I've lived in the country for half of my life, recently returning to it, but let me get into what happened. Me and my buddy Sean were sitting out at a bonfire, and we have an RV, and when it gets dark out here, it's freaking dark. So we were making jokes and talking about things and looking at the stars when the dog we have on the side, dog has a dog pen and a mini RV to sleep in, started barking and growling really aggressively before going silent. So me and Sean got up. I grabbed my shotgun. It's a one shot meant for hunting. And we walked over to check it out thinking he may have just seen a raccoon or something, but when we made it over there, he was just standing still, staring into the woods, and we heard something mimic the way my dog was barking, but it was a little bit deeper and sort of, I have no idea how to explain it honestly, but when we heard it, we booked ass back to the RV, locked the damn thing, and the noises stopped. But later in the night, Something was walking around the trailer slowly before going off. What could this have been? No, it wasn't a bobcat or a deer or a bear. I know their sounds, and trust me, anyone who doesn't know what they sound like would be scared shitless. Okay, so here's a quick edit to that. Day three. 
So me and Sean and his girl Liberty, we decided to have a campfire tonight. After the frustrations of having to fight the fire and be able to cook the hot dogs and bratwursts, we didn't have long enough metal poles. I built a fire that was too big and it was freaking hot. We decided to leave the baby in the RV and just chill, having s'mores and hot dogs as we passed around logger. We started hearing noises that sounded like my laughter in the woods, just like mine. Actually, and then a bunch of mumbling before all was quiet. The dog wasn't doing anything and he hasn't barked all day or all night. So we freaked out a bit, but decided to stay outside and be ballsy and make jokes, but it stopped and we eventually cooled back down and kept talking at the campfire. Then the motion light behind the RV turned on. We went to go check. Nothing. So we went back to our seats, then the motion light next to the dog pen turned on and something dark was laying behind the dog fence, covered mostly by the hill that met the road. You know how roads have sewer systems and the ground dips before coming back up again? That. And when the light turned off, I shined the flashlight over there. There was nothing there. So once again, pretty much paranoid, we returned to the fire, which was almost out and Liberty said she saw something off to the side, which we sort of ignored because she was scared shitless and she has schizophrenia. So between her demons, which she already sees, and what's real, we couldn't tell, so we just ignored her. After that, there was no incident for a while before I turned to my left. There's two trees right in front of the dog pen, and I decided to flash the flashlight over there and saw something duck behind the tree, something big and something dark, which at that point, we decided to call it a night, went back inside the RV, locked and shut all the doors and windows, and added covers to them. I'm writing this almost immediately after this happened. What the fuck is this thing? I'm alone in the RV with the baby right now, and it's playing ice cream truck music right behind the RV, and the motion light keeps turning on and off. It's using Sean's voice to call the baby, and she tried to press against the wall and started crying. She's crying very loudly, and I am scared, but oddly calm right now trying to be as still as I possibly can. It can mimic a lot of sounds. It's doing phone beeps, even though there are no phones in here besides mine. They took theirs. It tried doing a car door opening and shutting before stepping out onto the platform leading up to the RV, using his voice to say it was him. Hey, Tommy boy, it's me, Sean. Open the door, man. Come on. It's cold out here. Sean is not bothered by the cold. And Sean doesn't call me Tommy Boy. My uncle does sometimes. It walked away and the dog is strangely quiet now. It doesn't bark to alert me to the thing's presence anymore. It just hides. I don't know where. Now the baby is quiet, and I think it's watching to figure out another tactic. Sean said he would call me when he gets back, and the safe word is popcorn this time. Is there anyone who can tell me what this is and how I can keep it away from me and my family? Seventeen or eighteen years ago, my fiancé, now wife of nearly sixteen years, myself and one other couple went hiking the Pyramid Point hiking trail in the sleeping bear dunes of northwestern lower peninsula of Michigan at dusk. 
We had my old film camera with a 200 millimeter zoom lens on it. We got to the overlook, which looks northwest over the Manitou Passage to the Manitou Islands. We watched the sunset and entered that late dusk period that seems to last forever during a northern Michigan summer. It was probably 10 p.m. at this point. There were high winds and solid waves breaking on shore below us. The Pyramid Point overlooked as maybe 150 to 200 feet above Lake Michigan. But it didn't look at rougher than many evenings on Lake Michigan, where five-foot breaking waves are fairly routine and windy nights and crashing waves provide great white noise for sleeping in a tent. We were camping elsewhere. There's no camping at this trail. While standing and talking, we saw a light flash once out in the water between the islands and the mainland. In the vicinity of the North Manitou Shoal Lighthouse, a crib lighthouse standing alone in the water, not inhabited or staffed, but tempting for visitors, I would assume. Not sure, though. We stopped and looked, but weren't creeped out by it at all. After all, boaters are out in this stretch of water fairly regularly, though not in high winds and waves. I grabbed my camera to look through the zoom lens and could make out what appeared to be a small boat, though it was difficult to tell with a 200 millimeter lens. It's a seven mile wide stretch of water to the nearest island, so we were probably three to four miles away from the actual light. We had flashlights, so we shined our light, which was from several miles away, might not have even been visible in the direction of the light we'd seen waved it around immediately the light came back and started flashing sos and morse code which was a huge surprise to us we weren't even sure our lights were bright enough to be seen at that distance and given that the stretch of shore is almost all forested we were just a little spot several miles away we were suddenly full of adrenaline and concern. Two of us ran back to the car, a half a mile through the woods in the dark down a hill with our flashlight, and got a cell phone and binoculars. While we were gone, the folks on the lookout had no light source. At the car, we called the Coast Guard from our cell phones. It was 1998 or 99, so these weren't smartphones by any stretch of the imagination. We explained to the Coast Guard that someone was flashing SOS at us out in the water, and that we were hikers observing this from the Pyramid Point overlook. They said they'd send a ship to look out over the area, and we asked them to hurry. At this point, we ran back up to our overlook, half a mile up a steep hill, with binoculars, our phone, and our flashlight. Atop the overlook, there was no cell signal, so we had to pocket the phone and had no further communication with the Coast Guard. With our binoculars, we were able to see a guy in an aluminum rowboat, rowing like crazy with waves breaking over the bow of his boat. It was nearly pitch black outside, so we were only barely able to make this out. Maybe it was 10.30 or 10.45 at this point, and during a Michigan summer, it's still light enough outside to see well. He would occasionally turn around, flash SOS at us, and go back to rowing. It was disturbing to be several miles away, completely helpless, while we just watched the guy struggling in a rowboat in the dark. It got dark. We could not see anything anymore, but every few minutes, the man in the boat would flash SOS at us. He did not appear to be making any progress towards the mainland, but he was clearly drifting northward through the Manitou Passage. Every time he flashed, we'd turn on our flashlight, shine it back at him for a few seconds, and turn it off. We did not know Morse code, 
and we had no cell signal. We stood and watched for what seemed like forever, completely helpless. The man stopped flashing his light. It was too dark to see his boat. A tugboat that didn't appear to be a Coast Guard ship showed up and started doing a grid search pattern through the passage with bright lights shining from the boat into the water. The Manitou Passage is probably six to seven miles wide and six to seven miles long, so it was a slow search. A smallish Coast Guard ship started doing searches at the northern end of the straits, also with bright lights of their own. They met in the middle of the straits, having done a zigzag type pattern for what felt like an eternity. Then they sailed off they did not appear to find anyone. We drove to a bar in Glen Harbor to see if there was anything on the news. There wasn't. We called the Coast Guard the next day, wondering if we'd seen a man die or helped a rescue, or neither. But the person on duty had no idea what had happened. What a shitty shift change, perhaps or that we'd even called the night before. To this day, it's unsettling to me, knowing how harsh the conditions can be in Lake Michigan, and knowing that we'd seen a man flashing SOS at us through our binoculars just before it got dark was really bothersome, though not as bothersome as the poor guy in the boat who had to be wondering why we weren't doing anything to help him. So, no closure, no happy or sad ending. No ending at all, really, other than going back to our camp and hitting the sack, praying and hoping that guy was still alive. This happened in early November 2016. I was moving to Philly from Chicago, and my boyfriend had flown in to help me drive across country. My parents live in Ohio, so after making a pit stop there, we were on our way. Being broke at the time and wanting to save on tolls, we decided to take the toll-free route, which would land us in Philly in about 10 hours. Originally, we were going to leave my parents' place early, but we got distracted and didn't leave until about 4 p.m. Not a big deal. I've driven from Chicago to California, hiked parts of PCT and AT by myself. I was mostly bummed because the sun will be down by the time we get to all the pretty foliage in the Smokies. Now, the route we picked essentially had you dipping in and out of West Virginia and Pennsylvania. The parts of West Virginia we would be driving through are home to Mothman appearances. I was pretty excited about this, as those stories just fascinate me. Living in the city, I don't often get to see a clear night sky. Having road tripped a lot, I knew sometimes more scenic highways would have viewpoint pullovers. So, when we were in West Virginia, I told my boyfriend to Google one and see if anything popped up. Sure enough, he found one. Being busy driving, I didn't bother to look at what his GPS showed and just followed his directions. I thought it was weird that the GPS told us to get off the highway since normally these vistas are located right on the highway, similar to a rest stop. Whatever. We take the exit and turn down this dimly lit road and loads us up a smaller mountain base. I find it really strange that there aren't any other cars around. I did see a rusty sign for a scenic lookout and it pointed us down what looked like a service road. The road itself wasn't paved, and the only other road leading off of it was gated off. Both of us got a very weird feeling. I turned off the music because it was so creepy quiet, and my radio now sounded like I was blasting it from concert speakers. 
We would hear every leaf my car was crunching under its tires. After going maybe half a mile down this road, we got way too spooked and said fuck it, and I went to make a three-point turn to get out of there. At this point, the hair on the back of my neck is standing straight up. We drove maybe 50 feet before we saw a tree laying across the road we just drove on. Me turning around maybe took two minutes, and as I mentioned earlier, things were so quiet that we both knew we could have heard a tree fall down behind us. Panic started to take over, and something told me we can't just sit here and think long and hard about what to do. So, my boyfriend said he would see if he can lift one side of the tree and move it over. I had my brights on and was scanning the surrounding woods for any signs of movement. I felt eyes on us, but couldn't see anything. The tree didn't appear to be old, literally as if someone knocked it over just in front of us. As soon as my boyfriend was out of the car, the first thing I did was tell him I loved him and then locked the doors. I know, I'm an asshole. Thankfully, he was able to move the tree just enough for my car to squeeze through. And as soon as he was back in the car, we gunned it out of there. I'm a very spiritual person and believe that there are things in the woods that we don't always see. My boyfriend, on the other hand, is an atheist. The night we both agreed that something sinister was, in fact, out there. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, creepy, backwood stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout-out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Blaze, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Buzz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise Sess, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes. For without you, there would not be a me, and there would definitely not be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you. If you're sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there and take care of yourself. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.